another, there could be actually quite a lot of morphine that is present in the breast milk. I see that you nodded that you don't use it, so I, I won't spend more time talking about it. So yes to systemic opioids crossing the breast milk. I think it's important in the shared decision-making to tell women, if you're in pain it, and you feel you need the opioid, it's fine for you to take it, but you need to be aware that it will cross the breast milk. I've started doing that more and more, and then women say, oh, you know what? My pain is actually not that bad. If I risk harming my baby, I'd rather not take it. I think we've not spent enough time explaining to women what it is that our medication does. As for the alpha-2 agonists, given neuraxily, no passage, um, we haven't really given it uh, systemically, so the question um, is less relevant for our clinical practice. But to answer the question, the profile uh, between clonidine and dexmedetomidine is that there is um, a passage, and I think dexmedetomidine is actually more, um, more safe than clonidine would be if given systemically. Uh, there's a question on BMI and intrathecal morphine. I think uh, you had highlighted, but maybe you can just uh, for the delegates' satisfaction, so, we can review that question again. So this is a super question. Um, clinically, there, there's no study that has evaluated whether obese women are more likely to have respiratory depression than non-obese women with equal doses of neuraxal opioids. In other words, I know that some of my colleagues in the United States tend to reduce the dose of, of neuraxal opioids in morbidly obese patients. We actually don't do that. Our experience over decades now of neuraxal opioid use is that we don't have respiratory events and we haven't had a Narcan event in, in years now. In fact, we continue to redose the opioids if we have an epidural catheter in our morbidly obese patients, but we don't exceed three milligram. And we have a tiered um, monitoring approach for patients. So our morbidly obese patients are admitted to our step-down unit for 12 hours during which they're monitored. Then they can go to a regular postpartum unit. But if we are redosing the opioids, the nurses know that they're supposed to be monitoring every two hours. So I think it all depends with the ability to monitor patients adequately. And if the, the monitoring is an issue, I would say reduce the dose, but don't omit the neuraxial opioids in your morbidly obese patients. The alternative of having them get systemic opioids is worse than the, than, uh, the likelihood of having respiratory depression with neuraxial opioids. Uh, there are two small questions. Uh, one is, what is your experience of local anesthetic infiltration? of skin wounds, post-cesarean, and the so, second is the role of regional blocks. Are you using regional blocks? So because the regional blocks are an epidemic these days, everybody wants to do CHAP and QL, and should it be a routine or should it be just as a rescue block? Super question as well. So I think that my presentation showed that TAP blocks have zero role when given to every patient, if your practice is that you are given neuraxial long-acting opioids. In other words, you would be doing an intervention on patients who are most likely not going to, to see any benefit of it unless you are using long-acting uh, liposomal bifivacaine because the duration of action of your TAP block or your QLB is going to be shorter than the duration, duration of action of your neuraxial opioid. So to your question, do we do regional blocks routinely? The answer is no, it's absolutely not routinely done. Do we do it for breakthrough pain or rescue pain in a patient that we're seeing or is needing a lot of opioids? It is part of our approach. In other words, this is what we, we tell the obstetricians and our team, but we very rarely do that because our patients are not breaking through pain with the neuraxial opioids and the alpha-2 agonists that we give them. I do believe there's a place for neuraxial, uh, sorry, for regional blocks if the patient got a general anesthetic. So if a patient got an urgent general anesthetic and there was no neuraxial approach, we do the, we do the block before we wake them up. So as you saw, our general anesthesia rate is less than 2%. So it's not often that we do it, but we would do it on all our patients who, who did not have neuraxial opioids. Uh, well, I think this question must have come because in most of the Indian, um, you know, community, we do not use uh, morphine very, you know, uh, liberally. 
and that is one of the reasons uh, why uh, most of the delegates who are attending this uh, session uh, feel it's important to uh, give regional block in their practice mm -hmm. and that that is that is probably this question why this question came up well uh, the questions are many but if you are there in the gallery uh, we can uh, you know we can reconnect with you uh, and we can finish off the last talk sir is that okay thank you so much for having me thank, thank you so we uh, move on to our next speaker I introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ashraf uh, Habib from Department of Anesthesiology, Duke University, USA. Dr. Duke, uh, Dr. Uh, Ashraf is very well known and he is uh, he's in the editorial board of Anesthesia and Analgesia as senior editor, also in the editorial board of IJOA and DGA Education. He has served as a scientific review member in various uh, top level um, conferences like ASA, SOAP, and, SOSA, and SAMBA. Dr. Ashraf was also in the task force panel for Iraq. So he is going to speak today on the same topic, improving outcomes in cesarean delivery. Can Iraq achieve it? So I invite Dr. Ashraf Abhi to give his talk on this topic. Welcome, Dr. Ashraf. Hello, everyone. First, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to be part of this virtual meeting. And I would like to wish everyone a happy and healthy 2021. Today, I'm going to discuss enhanced recovery after cesarean delivery or Iraq, something that I'm really passionate about. Enhanced recovery after surgery or ERAS is a concept that combines various evidence-based aspects of perioperative care to optimize patient recovery. Initial studies on ERAS were conducted in the colorectal patient population and reported a significant improvement in various aspects of patient recovery, as well as a reduction in the duration of hospital stay. Subsequently, the concept of ERAS has expanded to other surgical specialties, and more recently, there has been interest in adopting ERAS principles to the obstetric patient population. But as we all know, our obstetric patients are very unique and present unique challenges. And therefore, while the general principles of ERAS remain the same, the specific details were vary in women undergoing cesarean delivery. And over the next 25 minutes, I'm going to discuss the various aspects of Iraq protocols, as well as the outcomes associated with their implementation. Here are my disclosures for research support and advisory board work I have done. And here is the outline of my talk. First, I'm going to discuss the quality of recovery indicators following cesarean delivery. Then I'm going to give you a broad overview of the essential elements of an enhanced recovery after cesarean delivery or an ERAC pathway. And then I'm going to talk into a little bit more details about certain specific elements of the Iraq protocol. And finally, we're going to talk about the impact of Iraq implementation. So let's start by the quality of recovery indicators following cesarean delivery. Recently, a quality of recovery score following cesarean delivery has been published, and it includes 11 items. And identification of those items will help us to know what are the aspects that we need to address in order to optimize patient recovery. So three items of this score deal with pain. So in order to address that, we need to implement a multimodal opioid sparing analgesic strategy. One item leads with deals with nausea and vomiting. So we address that by prophylaxis against intraoperative and postoperative nausea and vomiting and using opioid sparing strategies to avoid the emetogenic effect of opioids. Next is dizziness, and we address that by prevention of hypotension and by using non-sedating agents for analgesia and for management of side effects. Next item is shivering, and we deal with that by prevention of hypothermia. Next is breastfeeding and holding the baby, and 
We help with those items by providing early skin-to-skin -skin contact in the operating room, providing adequate post-operative analgesia, and providing breastfeeding support for our parturients. The last three items deal with the ability to mobilize independently, to look after personal hygiene, and to feel in control. And um, we help with those by removing barriers to early mobilization, by removing the IV and the urinary catheter early, by providing adequate post-operative analgesia and adequate control of post-operative nausea and vomiting, and by providing patient education so that our patients know what to expect during their hospital course, and therefore they can feel in control. Next, I'm going to provide you with an, a broad overview of the essential elements of the ERAC pathway. And similar to other enhanced recovery protocols, this is divided into preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative components. So the preoperative components first deal with patient education. We need to let the patients know what to expect during your, their surgery, what to expect during their hospitalizations. They need to know that we're going to aim to mobilize them early and to feed them early. They need to know what are our um, pain management strategies that we're going to use. They need to uh, know what, what to expect in terms of duration of hospital stay and what are, will be the criteria for discharge from the hospital. The antenatal period is also an opportunity to optimize comorbidities such as diabetes and hypertension and also to correct anemia. At our institution, we have an anemia clinic and we have certain criteria for referral or obstetric patients to the anemia clinic in order to optimize their hemoglobin. NPO status should be according to ASA guidelines, six to eight hours for solids and two hours for creel liquids. And many ERAS protocols include a preoperative carbohydrate drink two hours before um, surgery. And these carbohydrate drinks have been shown to uh, reduce insulin resistance, reduce preoperative thirst, hunger, and anxiety. Finally, we need to establish ERAS goals with the patients so that they are involved in the recovery process and motivated in order to move through all the goals that they need to achieve. Now let's talk about the intraoperative components. So the main anesthetic or the anesthetic of choice is nirexin anesthetic with long-acting nirexin opioids. We need to prevent infection by administration of appropriate antibiotics and providing skin and vaginal preparation. We need to prevent hypothermia by active warming, prevent hypotension, provide prophylaxis against intraoperative and postoperative nausea and vomiting. And final two um, items are delayed cold cramping and early skin-to-skin -skin contact. Postoperatively, the mainstay for postoperative uh, uh, recovery is the provision of adequate multimodal opioid sparing analgesia. We need to aim for early oral intake and early mobilization and remove barriers to early mobilization, including IVs and urinary catheters. At our uh, institution, we remove the urinary catheter six hours after surgery. We need to provide thromboprophylaxis according to guidelines, provide our patients with lactation support, and coordinate with the neonatal team uh, so that uh, patient discharge is not delayed because of issues relating to breastfeeding or relating to uh, the baby. And finally, you need to continuously audit compliance with the various elements of the protocol, as well as audit your outcomes in order to be continuously be able to fine tune your protocol and monitor and improve your outcomes. Now let's talk into a little bit more details about some elements of this protocol. And we're going to talk about hypotension, hypothermia, nausea and vomiting prophylaxis, and multimodal analgesia. So let's start with hypotension. And we now have very good evidence to show that fluid loading strategies have limited efficacy in the prevention of hypotension. Whether you give fluids by a preload or a coload, or whether you give crystalloids or colloids, at best, 
you reduce the instance of hypotension from 70 to 80 percent to about 60 percent. So the mainstay for the management of hypotension is the use of vasopressors. And this is not surprising because the main pathophysiology of hypotension is vasodilatation rather than hypovolemia. And now we have very good evidence to show that phenylephrine is the vasopressor of choice in obstetric patients. When compared to ephedrine, phenylephrine is associated with improved neonatal acid-base status, as well as improved maternal comfort and is less intraoperative nausea and vomiting when you use phenylephrine compared to when uh, you use an ephedrine. So what is the optimum method of phenylephrine administration? The optimum method is by, sorry, by giving it through a prophylactic infusion. This is one of many studies that compare the administration of phenylephrine by prophylactic infu infusion versus administration through uh, uh, Ebola for the tre treatment of established hypotension. And when you give it as a prophylactic infusion, there is less hypotension and there is less intraoperative nausea. In our practice, we initiate the phenylephrine infusion at 50 mics per minute, and then we um, change the uh, infusion rate if needed based on the blood pressure response. So what should be your uh, target blood pressure to maintain? This was an elegant study that uh, used the phenylephrine infusion and aimed for three goals for blood pressure control. One group had the blood pressure maintained at 80% of baseline, the other group at 90%, and the third group at 100% of baseline. And as you can see here, the tighter control the blood pressure, the less the instance of intraoperative nausea and vomiting. Nausea and vomiting occurred in 40% of patients when the goal was 80% of baseline, 16% when the goal was 90%, and in only 4% when the goal was 100% of baseline. In the last few years, there have been interest in using phenylephrine as a vasopressor, uh, sorry, norepinephrine as a vasopressor. And there are a number of studies that compared norepinephrine to phenylephrine. This is one of the best studies that have been published. As you can see here, there was no difference between norepinephrine and phenylephrine as far as systolic blood pressure control but because norepinephrine has a beta agonistic effect, heart rate was higher with norepinephrine compared to phenylephrine. And because of the higher heart rate, the cardiac output was higher with norepinephrine compared to phenylephrine. Stroke volume is the same, but the SVR is lower with norepinephrine compared to phenylephrine. So the higher cardiac output and the lower SVR could theoretically lead to improved peripheral perfusion. It could be could theoretically to improve placental perfusion and studies are needed to, um, uh, to investigate whether the use of norepinephrine can provide a benefit in certain high-risk uh, pregnancies. But for now, uh, there is no convincing evidence that it provides improved outcomes compared to phenylephrine and phenylephrine remains the vasopressor of choice at the time being. Next, for management of hypotension, we need to give appropriate doses of uterotonics. And historically, we have been giving large doses of oxytocin, much more than what we need. And oxytocin is our first uh, line agent uterotonic. This was uh, a study that looked at the ED90 of oxytocin infusion in non-laboring patient as well as in laboring patient. So those who are non-laboring, who did, were not exposed to oxytocin uh, before, the AD90 is 16 international unit per hour. And for laboring patients, it's more than double that uh, value. It's 44 international unit per hour. The same applies if you give oxytocin as a bolus. Um, the AD90 of oxytocin bolus for elective cesarean delivery is 0.35. And for intrapartum cesarean delivery is about 3 international units. So again, much less than what traditionally has been given, which was five to 10 units of oxytocin. This is a recent study that looked at the AD90 oxytocin uh, bolus in obese patients and found that it's actually almost double the 
uh, EG90 in non-obese patients. I'm not sure about uh, the practice in uh, India, but uh, in our uh, practice here in the US, we are seeing any, a lot of patients who have who are obese. So this is an important study uh, to remember. Last year, a international consensus statement about disease neutrotonics was published, and they recommend for elective cesarean delivery given giving one unit of oxytocin bolus followed by an infusion of 2.5 to 7.5 units per hour. And if we don't have adequate uterine tone after uh, two minutes, you give a further three units. For intrapartum cesarean delivery, they recommend giving three units to start with, followed by an infusion of 2.5 to 7.5 units per hour. Next, I'm going to talk about the prevention of hypothermia. And the impact of hypothermia has been very well characterized in the general surgical population. We have now very good data to show that hypothermia leads to increased blood loss, increased risk of complications, including wound infection and myocardial ischemia. It affects the pharmacokinetics of drugs and leads to prolonged duration of stay in the recovery room and prolonged hospital stay, therefore, leads to increased cost. However, hypothermia has not attracted a lot of attention in the obstetric patient, despite that the fact that it occurs very commonly in women undergoing cesarean delivery under spinal anesthesia. This was a study that showed that when no active warming is instituted, hypothermia occurs in 91% of patients. Even when active warming was instituted, the incidence of hypothermia was 64% in this study. So a significant number of patients become hypothermic. And it's not only the magnitude of hypothermia that's underappreciated, but it's also the duration of temperature, temperature drop is also very much underappreciated. This was a very elegant study from a group from South Africa, where, had the, where they had the patient ingest a temp temperature sensor and they managed to characterize the uh, hypothermic impact that occurs following spinal anesthesia in a patient population where active warming was not routinely used. So here you can see that the temperature dropped by a mean of 1.3 degrees, and the median time to the lowest temperature was one hour after the spinal anesthetic was given. In 75% of patients, the temperature continued to drop after leaving the uh, operating room. And in 29% of patients, the temperature did not return to baseline at the end of the eight hours of the study. And it took a median of about four and a half hours for the temperature to return to baseline. So what can we do about hypothermia? Active warming has been shown to be useful in reducing the risk of hypothermia. In this meta-analysis, you can see a, about a 34% reduction in the risk of hypothermia with active warming, a 42% reduction in the risk of shivering. The temperature at the end of surgery is higher with active warming. The patients have greater thermal comfort and umbilical RTPH is even higher when active warming is instituted. And not only active warming could be used, but also you have to pay attention to the ambient temperature in the operating room. This was a study that compared two ambient temperatures, 20 degrees versus 23 degrees, and found that with the higher temperature, the instance of neonatal and maternal hypothermia was significantly lower compared to the, to the lower temperature of 20 degrees centigrade. Next, I'm going to talk about nausea and vomiting prophylaxis. I'm going to start with intraoperative nausea and vomiting. And there are anesthetic factors and there are surgical factors that contribute to intraoperative nausea and vomiting. So first, anesthetic factors. Prevention of hypotension with using a variable rate phenylephrine infusion is very effective in reducing the risk of hypotension as we already discussed. Improving the quality of the block by adding a lipophilic opioid to your local anesthetic reduces the instance or the risk of intraoperative nausea and vomiting. This is, was a recently published meta-analysis that showed a 59% reduction, 
reduction in the risk of intraocular nausea and vomiting when you when you add intrathecal fentanyl. Intrathecal fentanyl improve the quality of the blood, re reduces intraoperative pain and the need for any um, uh, intraoperative opioid. All of these could lead to intraoperative nausea and vomiting. Giving prophylactic antiemetics, combination of antiemetics. A few years ago, we did the study where we um, use metoclopramide and ondansetron in patients who are receiving a phenylephrine infusion and found more than halving of the incidence of intraoperative nausea and vomiting with this combination in patients who are receiving phenylephrine infusion. Next, we'll talk about surgical factors, including extraization of uterus and irrigation, saline irrigation at the end of the section. So extraization of the uterus more than doubles the risk of intraoperative um, nausea and vomiting. Also uh, increases the risk of intraoperative pain and should, uh, should largely be discouraged. Intra-abdominal intra irrigation at the end of the section has also been shown to increase the risk of intraoperative nausea and vomiting, as well as the risk of post-operative nausea and the need for rescue antiemetics without any beneficial effect in terms of reducing the risk of infection, post-operative fever, or for post-operative endometritis. For post-operative nausea and vomiting, you need to use a combination antiemetic um, therapy. So in our practice, we use dexamethasone in addition to metoclopramide and ondansetron, as I already mentioned, that help with intraoperative nausea and vomiting as well. The details of the postoperative analgesic regimen will largely impact postoperative nausea and vomiting. So um, attention to the dose of intrathecal morphine and using opioid sparing um, techniques are essential to reducing the risk of post-operative nausea and vomiting. So now we'll talk about multinodal analgesia. And I know you just heard a lecture from Dr. Landau about post-operative analgesia, so I'm not going to spend uh, a lot of time on it. I'm just going to give you a few highlights. So first, we need to pay attention to the dose of uh, neuraxial morphine. We know that with neuraxial morphine, there's an analgesic ceiling and dose related increase in side effects, meaning that there's a certain dose above which you don't get any further improvement of analgesia, but you only get an increase in side effects like pruritus and nausea and vomiting. So for neuraxial morphine intrathecally, um, 100 to 150 micrograms is the dose to be used for epidurally three milligrams. Next, we, we need to use systemic adjuncts and we need to give non-steroidals and acetaminophen on a scheduled basis, round the clock, we need to give them concurrently rather than on alternating basis, and we need to initiate their administration preoperatively or intraoperatively rather than postoperatively. Other strategies such as gabapentin, ketamine, uraxial clonidine, truncal blocks, local anesthetic wound uh, infusion, could be very helpful in certain select patient population who, including patients with chronic pain or patients who are expected to have high levels of pain after surgery, but they're used on for all patients have not been shown to be beneficial. And for some of these um, uh, modalities such as gabapentin and ketamine, they can be associated with uh, side effects. Finally, truncal blocks with a long-acting preparation of epivacaine, just as Bacuzol and epivacaine, have recently been shown to be useful uh, in patients receiving direct morphine and uh, regular NSAIDs and acetaminophen. However, this is a uh, modality is expensive, so we need to consider the cost um, uh, efficacy, effectiveness ratio of this uh, intervention before uh, widespread implementation. Finally, in the next, in the remaining couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about the impact of Iraq implementation. And I'm going to show you a first study from a large integrated health system in uh, California that implemented uh, Iraq. Uh, and they showed that with Iraq implementation, including all the preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative components that we talked about, they achieved early ambulation, early uh, feeding they implemented a um, multimodal opioid sparing strategy and they significantly reduced post-operative opioid consumption. 
This is a meta-analysis that our group uh, performed. This data is not published yet, but uh, uh, I can uh, share with you some of the results here. Um, we can see as far as the process metrics, time of urinary catheter was uh, reduced by almost 12 hours with ERAC protocols. Time to mobilization occurred almost eight hours earlier with an ERAC protocol. Uh, opioid consumption was significantly reduced with ERAC protocol, and the duration of hospital stay was reduced by an average of half a day with uh, ERAC protocols implementation. So overall, significant improvement in, in outcomes and significant improvement in analgesia and opioid sparing. So in summary, Iraq is a um, protocol that really follows the best evidence for various aspects of in preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative care. It requires multidisciplinary um, collaboration, and it is a protocol that you have to develop for your own institution according to the resources that you have your own, in your own institution. You can adapt the protocol and implement the elements that work within your practice. And recently, the Society of Septic Anesthesia of Perinatology uh, and Perinatology, or SOAP, published their consensus statement and recommendation for enhanced recovery after cesarean delivery. And I highly recommend that you read uh, this um, document. Thank you so much for your attention and i um, be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Ashraf. And uh, we have uh, successfully completed all the lectures of today. And um, there are a couple of questions for you. One of the delegates has asked, um, this has been a very frequently asked question in other forums also, what is the role of chewing gum to increase bowel movements? So there is, uh, thank you for this question. Um, there have been some, um, literature mainly in non-obstetric patients showing potentially some beneficial effects of, of chewing gum for uh, uh, accelerating the time to return for bowel function. So I, I'm not aware of any studies in obstetric uh, literature, but in non-obstetric literature, yes, there are a number of studies showing that can potentially have some beneficial effect in accelerating return of bowel function. But well, these are mainly yeah. studies in patients who undergoing general anesthesia. Okay. Well, another question uh, is like, are there any barriers to implementation of Iraq bundles in uh, your setup? Like, So, of course, when you look at Iraq protocols in general, um, it varies from institution to institution what your practice was prior to uh, looking at adopting an Iraq bundle. Um, so for instance, when we look at our own practice at Duke, the main uh, change that we had to do was related to uh, patient education, formalizing patient education, formalizing patient education materials. Uh, the rest of the elements were largely part of our practice. Um, so the largest change really was related to uh, patient education and um, preoperatively and establishing uh, goals in conjunction with the patients to motivate them for the recovery uh, process. But of course, it's a multidisciplinary approach. You have to involve the obstetrician, you have to involve the nursing staff in order to be able to implement all these elements across all the, all the phases of care. Thank you very much. And uh, what would your take be for uh, in for the developing countries who have mm. issues in discharging these patients uh, second or third day post-surgery vis-a-vis Western world where the discharges are as such happening early? So how would you like to, you know, counsel us or how would you like to, you know, suggest us to implement Iraq bundles in this scenario? So this is a great question and something that comes up frequently regarding um, early discharge from the hospital. And actually, the question of discharge from the hospital is largely um, dependent on where uh, 
where people are practicing. So, for instance, if you compare, for instance, in, in, in the US versus the UK, the UK has largely been able to achieve first day discharges following cesarean delivery. Whereas in the US, in many states, there's certain requirement for the patients to remain in the hospital for a certain number of days. So I don't think that the duration of hospital stay should be the emphasis of Iraq protocols. I think the emphasis is optimizing all, our, all our, the other aspects of, of patient care. And uh, if it's possible to achieve earlier discharge because the patient has fulfilled all the discharge criteria, if you have <coughs> excuse me, adequate um, follow-up for the patients after discharge, I think one of the big differences, for instance, between the US and the UK is that in the UK, they have mid midwife uh, follow-up for the patients at home which facilitates the follow-up and, and ensuring that the patients are doing well, where this, this is not um, really happening in the US. So it's really uh, country dependent and practice dependent. And the duration, again, the duration of hospital stay should not be the main emphasis or the main outcome of Iraq protocols. Well, I'm not able to understand the question completely, but uh, it says, uh, what is the role of extraperitoneal approach by obstetrician to do LSCS for Iraqs? I, is, the, I, is this question relating to... Uh, I feel it must, be, uh, it must be exteriorization uh, of uterus, no. Extra peritoneal approach by OB to do LSCS by Iraq. I think uh, we'll ask the delegate once again because uh, um, it's not very clear. Okay, uh, another one, another question is like uh, considering developing countries and the social customs, somebody has asked this question also, in which uh, women are not allowed to leave the house for one month post uh, delivery. Would the Iraq protocol be, you know, violate, violated in such cases, or we are only limited till discharge from the hospital, or we want the woman to be up and about when she goes home too? We definitely want the women to be up and about in the hospital and when she goes home. Uh, we know that our uh, obstetric patients are at a higher risk of thromboembolic complications, so we need them to mobilize early, both during hospitalization and after discharge from the hospital. And this is this is really the role of patient education and the role of uh, uh, adapting the patient education to your local practice. So what I'm, uh, the information I'm giving to my patients at my institution here at Duke would be very different from another institution in the US, which would be very different from another institution in India because you know, the, the general principles are known, but you adapt these principles according to your local practice. So, and you, you adapt your education according to your local practice and your local customs. Okay, the question says that uh, without opening the peritoneum, if you are doing LSCS. I'm not sure I understand the question whether it relates to closing the peritoneum uh, during the repair uh, of uh, there are the obstetrician practices there are some obstetricians who close the peritoneum others who don't and there are data to show that there are really no clear benefits from closing the peritoneum so in our institution we don't our our surgeons do not do not close the peritoneum but I know there are surgeons differences in terms of um, their practice whether they close the peritoneum or not but there are several data to show that closing peritoneum really doesn't confer any additional benefit and just prolongs the duration of, of the surgery i hope this is the answer to that question well uh, if there's anything we'll get back to you uh, we can uh, be uh, still online because we have some questions lined up for dr Irwin, dr zen dr turan and sobna and dr Thomas Drew. If you don't mind, we can all come on the panel and we can just take the questions one by one and everybody can, uh, you know, take the questions. So I'll request the web flag. Yeah. We have everybody in the gallery view and we can, yeah. So, yeah. 
So I can ask uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Arvind first. There are some questions for you, Arvind. There is Arvind. Uh, absolutely, yep. Yeah. I'm listening. Yeah. Arvind, I sent you the question. So uh, we'll start with the, some people are asking if you have to give oxygen support to women uh, who are pregnant, can we use non invasive ventilation? Um, absolutely. You know, I think uh, nothing changes. You know, I think uh, at our institution, um, they are just treated like um, every other critically ill person. If a non invasive ventilation is required, they're not denied that opportunity. Uh, the one thing I don't have experience with is prone positioning, but I know that there have been a couple of reports um, uh, suggesting the feasibility of uh, prone ventilation in pregnant subjects. Is the risk of bleeding more in COVID-19 patients undergoing C-section? Uh, not that I'm aware of, you know, I'm not aware of any literature. Um, and in fact, uh, the opposite uh, might possibly be a problem, which is um, immunothrombosis and the possibility of VTE. Again, you know, the evidence for that is weak as well. Um, so I don't think there's uh, good data to suggest that there's excessive bleeding in patients with COVID-19. And there's another question which asks uh, whether there is any correlation between the pathophysiology of preeclampsia and COVID, considering both, you know, are concerned with endothelial damage. And does COVID worsen PIH and vice versa? I think that's a great uh, question. You know, I can um, answer the first component. Um, certainly, at least um, in my institution, a vast majority of patients with critical COVID-19 have always had either chronic hypertension or a diagnosis of preeclampsia. Uh, and those are the patients who ended up being more sick than uh, the other non-hypertensive cohort. So there's, you know, at least anecdotally, I see some kind of association, but I'm, again, not aware of good quality literature that has teased this uh, data apart to tell with clarity whether that's true. Uh, but if you look at uh, ACE2 expression in you know, all the uh, uh, angiogenic factors, you know, it makes sense that uh, COVID-19 would probably be more um, of a problem with preeclampsia patients. Regarding the second question, um, I have absolutely no idea whether it worsens preeclampsia or whether you know, preeclampsia has uh, another you know, modifying influence on COVID-19. That's, again, um, I have not come across uh, good um, uh, uh, data to make any recommendation. I think we can ask Dr. Ruth to also pitch in any answer because uh, she has also good experience and anybody out, out among you who has uh, also worked in COVID, all of us have done actually. So maybe Dr. Ruth can put in some words too. Thank you. So interestingly, our patients have not been that Sick. It's interesting. We have been giving oxygen. We have been giving even uh, CPAP. We have been putting them in negative pressure rooms to reduce the likelihood of having um, healthcare providers um, um, contamination and, and exposure. We have not had to manage patients in the prone position, and so I have zero experience with that. Of all our sick patients, we only had one or two who actually required um, uh, intubation, and we were quite happy to see that our outcomes were positive. I think that others here on the call, Dr. Leffert, Dr. Habib as well, have actually managed quite sick patients. So uh, anybody, who can, anybody else would like to add on to this? So there's another question also, uh, someone has asked, is the risk of bleeding more in COVID-19 women? And if so, can we give tranexamic acid to these women if they're posted for a scheduled LSCS and they're bleeding profusely on table? We're nodding our heads here. Obviously, the, <laughs> it's a trade-off. The, the risk benefit, you don't want a patient to be exsanguinating and, uh, and, and lose you know, an excessive amount of blood. On the other hand, we know that COVID is associated with an increased coagulation profile. So giving PXA 
uh, carries a risk. Obviously, there's been no study. There is very limited evidence to support the use or not of tranexamic acid. I think it has to be a case-by-case -case decision on, on, on looking at whether other interventions are actually you know, decreasing the blood loss and improving the coagulation uh, cascade. Um, I believe we have not used it, but again, we haven't found the need to do it. And I think this is a perfect um, question to be addressed in large series. And I don't think we'll ever be able to do randomized controlled trial to assess that, but maybe people's experience will inform our decisions in the future. I think when it's really important not to extend that worry to uh, neuraxial anesthesia and patients with COVID. Um, so the vast majority of patients with COVID can safely get neuraxial anesthesia, and that's important to remember. One thing that we've been trying to do is bedside thromboelastogram, and that has been somewhat helpful in sort of organizing our thoughts of where patients are but it's, it's a difficult and evolving situation and even TEG takes some time before we get information. Well, uh, uh, Dr. Zen, there is another question for you. Do TOLAC patients need any special changes in monitoring or drug concentration and precautions during labor anesthesia? Yeah, I think any standard um, sort of considerations apply to TOLAC patients and it mostly has to do with having adequate personnel available just in case you need to do a stat cesarean delivery. So even if you have a Naraxo, a DPE, a conventional epidural or a combined spinal epidural, you need to have personnel readily available to do the stat cesarean delivery. One thing that we have found is even after a DPE where a stat cesarean delivery has been called is um, we've been fortunate that we have not seen abnormally high um, blocks resulting from those um, types of techniques. And, and so we feel very comfortable in just um, doing what we normally do. Uh, we dose very carefully, we aspirate between small doses and we watch for clinical effects. So there's another one. What is your opinion on reversal of motor block using epidural saline? Yeah, that's uh, a question that we actually looked at some time ago. And there does seem to be some value in giving epidural saline to wash out, if you will, an epidural space. Um, we found the effect to be very modest and you must use preservative free saline. Um, we we have considered sending it more aggressively, um, but it's been kind of low priority um, on our docket. But it's an interesting process. So then there's another one which says, uh, does the level of puncture on skin and depth of catheter insertion affect the epidural dose? Does the depth? Um, you know, this probably relates in part to is someone high BMI and or a large individual and in terms of what response people have to both combined spinal epidurals, dural puncture epidurals, and conventional epidurals, there is some data to suggest that high BMI individuals need slightly less amounts of medication in their epidural space. Um, thinking that there is increased uh, intraepidural pressure and therefore any injectate into that pressurized zone is spread farther. But more, more data needs to be collected in this regard. Uh, so there's, there's one more question, if you can take it. Your experience in COVID patients needing labor anesthesia. Yeah, uh, and this is good for the entire group, yes, uh, Arvind. Yes, yeah. uh, Kachal, do you mind uh, repeating the question? Uh, yeah, the question is, what is your experience in COVID-19 patients needing labor anesthesia? Well, you know, we've been um, doing exactly what we have done before, uh, offering 
uh, labor analgesia services to pretty much um, every patient with COVID-19. In fact, uh, we've been more aggressive uh, with offering labor analgesia primarily uh, to prevent uh, the possibility of having to administer an unplanned general anesthetic. Uh, so in fact, we've been um, uh, um, you know, placing preemptive epidurals in some patients, you know, even when they're not in labor, uh, to, to avoid those circumstances. So that's been my experience. It's not, nothing has changed. Um, and in fact, uh, the risk versus benefit, even in the setting of low platelet counts that can occasionally um, uh, uh, be there uh, would firmly be skewed towards neuraxial analgesia. There's another one coming up on COVID. I think Dr. Ruth can take it. Are you giving NSAIDs to COVID patients? There was a discussion in the beginning of the pandemic to avoid it. That's a super question. There was some, well, not, there were some suggestions coming from the French community that NSAIDs given to patients who were having who were infected could actually exacerbate the severity of the disease. However, this has not been confirmed and uh, the French government retracted this recommendation. In our early approach, we said that in the absence of strong evidence, consider omitting the NSAID, but, but very rapidly the SOAP in particular, the interim recommendations actually reassured the OB anesthesia community that um, omitting the NSAIDs would actually co <laughs> contribute to what we're trying to avoid, which is reliance on opioids. And therefore, the recommendations were, were pretty straightforward that NSAIDs should and could be given to patients with uh, COVID disease. So yes, absolutely, it's not a contraindication. There's absolutely no evidence that it um, increased the severity worsen the severity of the disease or had any impact on the course of the on the prognosis of the of the conditions thank you very much and there are a few questions for dr turan and dr shobna the first one which is like uh, which has been asked by many many people is the rationale of performing a hysterotomy prior to handheld vessel ligating technique what is the you... rationale of performing a hysterotomy prior to handheld vessel ligating techniques. Why should we do it? So do you, you mean that the uh, opening hysterotomy using linear yes. cut, right? Yes. Okay. The reason for is a uh, hysterotomy when you do an incision, it bleeds. It's about, according to approximately the studies, about 400 to 500 cc bleeds from just on the hysterotomy site. And if you even put a whip stitch to close the uterus, um, that bleeding is continuous. It doesn't really stop. And if you think that the hysterectomy takes about an hour or one and a half hour, that bleeding continues as always. And you add your blood loss, increase your blood loss. That's the reason um, I use linear cutter to cut the uterus. Then that edges doesn't bleed during my hysterectomy time. And it's actually, uh, it's actually more beneficial for us to control blood loss. Sorry, hospital is calling me. Um, we can take the call a little later. No, 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 no. <laughs> I will, I will come back then. I just want to tell one more comment about the previous question um, a, about the extra peritoneal C-section. As a surgeon, I think I can answer best that question. The question was extra peritoneal C-section, which is a very old technique used in 1960s, 1950s, when we do not have enough antibiotic coverage means that you don't go into the abdominal cavity, you just elevate the peritoneum and reach the uterus and do the C-section. Um, I don't remember when I did last time because after the antibiotic era, we don't really concern about this uh, infection. Um, I don't have any experience to answer the question of um, if Iraq uh, works better in those cohorts or not, but logically, yes, because you're not in the belly. So the, uh, the other question was, is if you're using that linear stapler, can you tell us what is the cost of that stapler and uh, would it be good enough to go with only ligating bit by bit rather than, you know, doing um, this, uh, using this linear stapler, especially for a developing nation like ours? Good question. Excellent question. So as everyone know, you know, knows that the your technique, your approach is 
as uh, delineated by your you know culture or environment in the united states that that is not too expensive it's not more than a hundred dollars but could be a hundred dollars a big money for other nations um in olden days what i was using uh, doing a small incision using clamps 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 and ligating one by one it takes some time um, but if you leave open the hysterectomy or just try to close immediately, definitely you increase your blood loss. Um, in the United States, it's not too expensive um, and it is doable very easily. Sorry, sir. Uh, then um, there's one very challenging question someone has asked, and that is if you are faced with the situation where you have to do a perimortem C section on an obese parturient with placenta creta, what would be your take? Uh, I mean, if I don't misunderstand, the mother is already dead, correct? Yes, it's yes. Mortem. Yeah, like I mean, resuscitated with hysterectomy. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's we don't need to restrict them. We just take the baby out, try to save the baby, and close the uterus. I guess that's the best option. And, um, well, for Dr. Shobna, there were a couple of questions, like I think she has already answered in her slides. There were questions on what should be the minimum uh, blood we should reserve for a patient with placenta creta. So you had already, I think, written, but you can still tell them uh, for the sake of, you know, um, revision. Uh, sure. Like, again, it depends on what your average blood loss is. Um, like I said, in our practice, before Dr. Turan introduced this LCVSS technique, we used to have a uh, six, six, and one, you know, for Paxil's, FFP, and platelets in the room, uh, because at that time our average blood loss was 35 under. Um, but now we just have four units of Paxil's in the operating room, and uh, regardless of the um, placental invasion, um, we have four units these days. You know, be it an accreta or be it a um, a percreta. Uh, there's another question. Uh, how do you prevent hypothermia in a patient who has massively bled? Like, do you use under patient drapes or is it only the warming systems you're using? Or you're using something else too because, uh, you know, hypothermia is going to worsen the outcome of the patient. Uh, that is correct. So um, we have to start warming the patients from the get go. Um, you know, in the, especially in these planned cases, you know, as soon as you lay the patient down, get started, you, uh, we use a forced air warmer. And then uh, we also have a warming mattress. So we have two of that plus the fluid warmer. So we have like about three devices to help warm the patient. And it definitely is a challenge because our patients are on lithotomy and all the uh, surface area that we are exposed is, um, you know, uh, just the um, upper chest and the arms. So um, it is a challenge, but uh, if you get started, uh, you know, ahead in the game, um, it, it would help. What is the role of interventional radiology in patient of placenta acreta spectrum? Should it be routine or only in very high risk patients? Um, I'm going to defer that question to Dr. Turan, actually. <laughs> so um, we don't use uh, aortic balloon or any kind of um, balloon placement um, because a occlusion of blood vessels is actually increase your blood loss before the complete dissection of the um, bladder that is the, the key point of my technique or our surgical technique therefore i don't use in some cases um, i leave the placenta in because of the uh, extension of the placenta to the parametrium or into the bladder and to avoid a significant blood loss i didn't go that detail in my presentation because it's a limited time um, i leave the placenta in at those cases sometimes i go and embolize the uterine arteries to go back in for the six weeks later to do definitive surgery, but I don't use routinely. And there's one question, I probably this is from an obstetrically. Are there any tips and tricks to identify the adherent bladder during the surgery? Oh, I mean, it is very easy to identify that that is uh, adherent. If if you don't see any plane, that's that's. That's the reason is not for the placenta actually because of the multiple surgeries. 
uh, as we know very well, all those cases has more than two or three C-sections. Rarely it can happen in one C-section, but most of them has three, four, five C-sections, and that's that adhesions creates a huge uh, impact on the when your dissection. Um, when you hold the bladder and it's just on the placenta, it's not moving. That's that's pretty clear. It's it's not it's going to be difficult to dissect. I think that's a very challenging question. Uh, there are many more, but I'll stop at that. There is one for Dr. Thomas Blue. How to prevent nausea, vomiting, fall, falling carbofrost uh, administration? Thank you for the question. Um, I'm not sure that that has been studied in particular. So I think that the sensible option would be to use the drugs that we already have and that we know are effective at cesarean section, particularly on Vanstron. I know there's increasingly more evidence for the use of dexamethasone at cesarean section, um, particularly for post-operative analgesia as well, as well as any other anti-emetics that we have available. But as I did mention, of course, these side effects are um, serious. Uh, they're serious for our patients, and they're, they are what stop our patients um, leaving hospital on time. And I think that's increasingly important um, particularly in this world of RAS uh, that has uh, been discussed uh, so well uh, through the seminar. Thank you, Dr. Drew. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we can close the session. It has been a very, very interesting <laughs> evening. And we look Actually, forward um, to Dr. Actually, yeah. Dr. Kajal Jain, this is Shobana. I just wanted to add um, for the initial um, question or comment about the prone position, uh, there was a talk, Dr. Um, Palani Sami. Um, we just wanted to add our um, experience with the prone position uh, for the COVID patients. Uh, we do have uh, quite a number of sick patients in our hospital. In fact, we have one who is on ECMO and a trach and all that. Um, so we do do prone positioning in the ICU. Um, you know, uh, we have like uh, certain uh, devices where uh, that would accommodate the pregnant uh, uh, abdomen, and uh, also uh, we have done uh, twelve-hour trials. We are trying to um, look into the data about um, how much has that, uh, um, you know, uh, changed the patient's uh, um, course. Uh, we have awake patients uh, who are on oxygen uh, requirement in our labor and delivery unit who self-prone. Um, so um, we are actually um, starting to look at the data on those patients um, who do uh, undergo the proning. But the, our ICU, the uh, lung rescue unit, where uh, we have these patients or the um, medical ICU uh, is where we have these patients and we've been doing some prone positioning. It, it takes a lot of team effort. It takes a lot of team effort, but um, but it is being doable in our cell. So uh, that's a very good um, good update on uh, patient management who are very very sick and require uh, proning and then ECMO um, for ECMO also. Thank you very much. And uh, again, I would like to thank all the speakers on behalf of uh, the National Association of Obstetric Anesthesiologists who have um, you know, come forward to deliver important information on pregnant women and for, for safer life births. I extend a very, very hearty thanks from all of us. And I expect that we all will be to together even tomorrow morning. If you, if you can be with us, that will be really good. And so just to you know, give a concluding uh, note to this event, I would like you to please rise up for the national anthem of my country. And if you can, please uh, we'll just rise up and we'll sign off for today. <laughs> Chana jala dhitaranda Tava shubhaname jage 
तव शुभ आशीष मागे गाहे तव जय गाथा जन गण मंगल दायक जय हे भारत भाग्य विधाता जय हे जय हे जय हे जय 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 हे Thank you very much. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.